Hello and welcome to this special conversation at ORF. I'm Nagma and joining me today are two special guests, Professor Harsh Pant and Nandan Unnikrishnan. And we're here to discuss the situation in Russia and Ukraine and the entire Europe and what does it mean for the world? Why did, uh, why did Russia actually uh, enter Ukraine and uh, the West's worst fears have come true. So what's the way forward and how does it impact all of us? So to look at all that, we have Nandan Unikrishnan and Professor Harshpan. Nandan, uh, since Vladimir Putin recognized Luhansk and Donetsk and uh, what, I, what the West was uh, always saying that the Russia that Russia is going to actually attack Ukraine. So that worst fear came true, though Russia has been saying that it is not interested in actually capturing Ukraine, but it wants to liberate Ukraine, some regions of Ukraine at least. Now the situation that is evolving, it's a very dangerous situation and Putin is being accused of pushing the world into another war after the pandemic. But let's look at why did this situation evolve the way it has happened right now? What led to this situation? I want to understand what's your take on this. Thank you, Nagma. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, of course, the history is very long, but I'll try and break it down into a few sort of sentences. Uh, the problem really started when the Soviet Union was still uh, an entity that existed. It started with uh, German reunification. At that point of time, uh, the Soviet Union accepted that the Berlin Wall would come down and uh, Germany would be reunited on the understanding that Germany would join NATO, that the United Germany would be part of a uh, military alliance, but that military alliance would not uh, proceed uh, further eastwards towards, at that point, the Soviet Union. And therefore, the Warsaw Bloc also would be dismantled. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the Russians, or fortunately, I don't know, it depends on which side of the fence you're sitting, uh, the uh, Russians did not get this particular clause uh, in written form from their uh, uh, American counterparts, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, believed that uh, verbal assurances would be sufficient. and. To that extent, I mean, although I believe it's very naive uh, of the Russians, but to that extent, uh, to whatever extent, it did work till about 97. You see, And uh, in 97, we had uh, Russia entering into an arrangement with uh, uh, NATO for a partnership agreement. So it appeared that uh, everything would be all right. But then suddenly, in subsequently after 97, you have these waves of expansion of NATO, you know, Poland, uh, the Czech Republic, others coming in. Then subsequently, again, uh, in the second wave, you have the Baltics who are taken in. Now, the Russians protest this, but again, they are told that, look, the partnership agreement we signed does not say anything about expansion. Russia was weak. It was unable to stand up. So the verbal assurances were not sufficient. So this is where we arrived in 2008. 2008, there was a NATO summit at which, uh, although Europe resisted, I mean, namely Germany and France, uh, so they resisted an open invitation to uh, Ukraine and Georgia to join NATO. Uh, they compromised on keeping a kind of a vague statement saying that the organization was open to Ukraine and others, any, everybody else joining. The Russians again protested, uh, but were unable to really do anything. However, at that point, what happened was Georgia got ideas and moved forward and decided to reclaim uh, some of what were considered rebellious territories, South Ossetia and Abkhazia. The moment Georgia did that, the Russians uh, intervened militarily to uh, station their troops in those areas. <coughs> Sorry, push back uh, the Georgians uh, across the border. 
sorry, uh, pushed back the Georgians across the border. And uh, everyone in that sense got the message, George Bush and everybody, that the Russians were not too keen on anyone else joining the NATO, who, a country which had a border with uh, uh, the, the, the Russian Federation. However, uh, recently, uh, two years ago, it started in uh, Ukraine, after the Crimean uh, crisis and all, uh, they, the Ukrainian uh, politicians internally revived this conversation about NATO membership. Uh, I personally don't believe that NATO was at all interested in this. But the problem is that NATO could not at the same time say no to them outright. So this brought up some kind of hope. And in the process of that hope growing in Ukraine, the leadership of Ukraine stalled what appeared to be a political diplomatic solution to the Ukrainian problem, which were the Minsk agreements. Now, the Minsk agreement yes. required some clauses to be implemented by Ukraine, after which uh, a lot of other things would happen. And Ukraine refused to make those changes in their constitution. And anyone who touched the Minsk agreements to implement uh, immediately uh, was literally politically punished. So you have the former president, Poroshenko, who uh, signed the Minsk agreements. Today, he's facing charges of treason in parliament. You know, yeah. so it's a complicated situation. At which point, now we've arrived in February uh, 2022, uh, Mr. Putin made, or Russia made what they think are the last efforts to revive the Minsk process. There were two meetings, one in Paris, one in uh, Berlin. And again, there again, the Western partners do not deny the allegations or the charges that the Russian made that there was no attempt to force Ukraine to adhere to the Minsk agreements. And Ukraine was adamant that it would not implement some of those clauses. Once that was clear, the Russians came to the conclusion that the Minsk agreements were dead. So the diplomatic route, as far as they were concerned, was closed. And they had to uh, decide. I mean, they, they, they had to uh, take steps to protect their own security. Now, this may sound as, as if I am an uh, apologist from, uh, for the Russians, but that's not the case. I'm merely trying to lay out the uh, uh, Russian thinking on this. And I don't think any kind of intervention is justified. I mean, particularly what the Russians have done right now. I don't think that is justified. But this is the reasoning that has brought us here to what is happening today. Sure. Absolutely. Thank you so much for putting that in perspective for us. Uh, I mean, uh, otherwise, in the mainstream media, the narrative that you see is Russia has attacked Ukraine and now U.S. should arm Ukraine. And Ukraine, of course, is a democratic country which has a right to decide for itself. But Harsh, how do you look at this? Uh, Russia has been constantly accusing NATO and the U.S. of its eastward expansion. And Russia has been um, resisting that. But there were efforts diplomatically that failed, that did not actually reach any conclusion. Could this have been solved diplomatically? Um, I mean, of course, what Putin has done now is really not a whimsical action. He must have thought about it. But is this or can this be seen as a Putin pushback? You know, Nagma, I think, yes, in the, what Nandan has laid out. And I think this is indeed a, a pushback uh, to uh, to his, you know, to a sense of grievance uh, that has uh, been prevailing in, in, in Russia for a very long time. Uh, and I think in particular with Mr. Putin, who looks at the dissolution of Soviet Union as the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 21st century. So certainly there is you know, this idea of reviving, uh, you know, what uh, what Russian sphere of influence is, is very significant part of that historical memory. And uh, perhaps Mr. Putin's uh, or, uh, you know, internal determination to see through. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I also think that there is a, you know, that there is a larger question of, uh, of, uh, uh, Ukraine being, uh, I think, a subset of a larger issue of the geopolitical reordering of security in Europe. 
uh, and from that perspective, whether this is simply one aspect of a larger arrangement. And I think all the negotiations, for example, uh, that uh, we were talking about, the demands that Russia made, uh, actually were not demands made. I mean, if you look at the demands, the three demands that the Russians made, uh, they were largely demands made to the West or in particular to the US. And I think that the idea that, look, we are demanding that uh, Ukraine does not join NATO as well as uh, NATO's military hardware comes out of Eastern Europe. I think these are the demands that are not demands being made of Ukraine. These are the demands that are being made of the US in particular and NATO uh, in, as an institutional framework. So I think that this is also a part of, uh, and I think uh, you know, much as it is unfortunate, but that's the tragedy of great power politics, that when you enter that space, uh, you know, the tragedy unfolds in a way where the weaker states fall by the wayside. Uh, and it is, I mean, to, to someone sitting in 21st century, it does look a bit archaic that, look, we are talking about spheres of influence. We are talking about, uh, you know, countries that are uh, technically uh, sovereign, but do not have the right to decide or, or should not have the right to decide where they want to go. Uh, and I think those those questions are bigger questions than simply, uh, you know, uh, what has happened in, uh, you know, what Russians are doing in Ukraine. Uh, I think there is a certain logic to their claim. There is a certain logic to, the, to their demands. But I think the the idea that um, uh, you know that in this day and age, uh, European theatre would face something, I think, is both uh, at some at some point. And uh, you know, Nandan was talking about the naivety of Russians at one point. I think there has been a naivety on the part of Europeans also at the other, at the other point, where they thought that somehow uh, those issues would dissolve themselves uh, away, and uh, and that. Uh, uh, Europe would never become a, a theater of a geopolitical activity. I think it's only recently that uh, that uh, the European Union is talking of itself as a geopolitical actor. So I think this this idea that somehow you can live in a bubble of your own making uh, without recognizing either that you know one of the in, in, most interesting sure. things is that wars never end. Whether you know in in a sense Cold War never ended. Uh, it just uh, it, it just continued in the minds uh, of of Russians to a certain extent. Those grievances uh, continued, and without the resolution of the grievances, what I'm afraid is that this is not the end. You know, mm -hmm. after all, if Mr. Putin's claim is that he doesn't want uh, um, NATO on his doorstep by having Ukraine uh, with, with him, he's again having uh, NATO on his doorstep. It's not as if uh, he's going to have uh, NATO further away. Uh, Poland, Hungary, and Czech republics are around uh, there. So I think in, in some in some ways. This is not the end. This is perhaps a beginning again of a uh, of a long-standing struggle between uh, between the two blocks and the two ideologies that we will continue to see uh, operating. And I and I am afraid that uh, that uh, at, at the moment, at least diplomatically, it doesn't look like that there is a solution yeah. between Ukraine and, and and Russia. Sure. So how does uh, how do you see this will unfold, Nandan? I mean, uh, of course, Putin makes it very clear that he right now he he he, he looks like. Um, he just wants to keep this area tense. Uh, he does not want to capture the areas. But uh, the situation will remain like this. What are the options for, for Russia? And uh, Putin has probably just sent his first draft on a new order in Europe and probably a new world order. That's what uh, we are looking at. So um, how will it alter the relationships or the, or the course of the transatlantic and the Indo-Pacific? Uh, all of it is getting affected by what's happening right now. Nagma, uh, just two curious asides uh, before I go in because of uh, sparked off by something Harsh said. Uh, you know, one is I think uh, the Russians, yes, definitely, they do have a grievance that they are being treated as the defeated party in the Cold War. Uh, their understanding is that they were not defeated, that the Soviet Union dissolved, not because of any kind of military defeat. And then they have had their own problems. They, it was an internal issue. That is one aspect of it. But you know where the mistake is, and this is the problem that we all face in our, we identify Putin with the Soviet Union. The problem is Putin is nothing. He hates the communist. Putin, you have to identify with Tsarist Russia. And Tsarist Russia was several times bigger than the Soviet Union in geographical terms. It incorporated Poland and Finland too. So, uh, and the current territories of, and the Soviet Union. So I think the throwback of Putin 
is far more dangerous in reality than what you're talking about. You know, this what he said in Munich about geopolitical disaster. I think people misunderstood. He was saying that the communists were the disaster, that they destroyed mm -hmm. his country, mm -hmm. that his country was yeah. a different country, you know, and Russian nationalism was supreme in the Tsarist uh, Russia. So I mm -hmm. think you know, we need to tone down. I mean, uh, not tone down. We need to pro show this nuance in our understanding. There is no ideological battle between Russia and the United States. There are different forms of capitalism. One is absolute oligarchic corrupt system. The other is a more, uh, far more democratic. Uh, I will not say not corrupt, but nevertheless, <laughs> uh, far more democratic system. So yeah. that is the political superstructure sitting on top may be different. But so in a way, in a way, a contest for a new world order for sure. Yes, undoubtedly, undoubtedly. Yes. So yeah. I don't think at some levels, I think what is happening, and here I completely agree with uh, Harsh, you know, the bigger issues tend to come into smaller what conflict. So what is essentially happening is uh, uh, a country aspiring to be a local hegemon, you know, of the uh, area around it is clashing with a country that believes it continues to be the only hegemon in the globe. So it is a bit of a uh, sort of clash of two uh, understandings of the world, the Russian understanding that we are strong enough and the US understanding saying that, uh, look, hello, this is our territory. You can't come in and start. So European security and Harsh is absolutely right is not up from discussion as far as the Americans are concerned. They may discuss Ukraine uh, or Georgia, but they are not going to give Russia a veto on European security, on what mm -hmm. uh, Europe takes vis-a-vis -vis its own security. That is one aspect. Second is, I don't think actually uh, the diplomatic door is closed. Uh, yes, Minsk is frozen for the time being, but Let's be a little cynical and look at what actually has happened on the ground. One is Russia is definitely not planning to stay. Mm -hmm. Russia is planning to what I would say, I mean, we all would uh, describe otherwise as regime change, right? They want to have a, a regime brought in that is less susceptible to pressure from the ultra right within the uh, Ukrainian polity. They may, they may not succeed. I'm not getting into what, yeah. I'm just saying this is the end product. That mm -hmm. is what I mean by uh, denazification, you know, because yeah. they feel that these uh, extreme right elements have too much influence on the uh, decision making process in uh, politics in Ukraine. So, so he is not, he is not getting into this issue of, I will occupy that area and stay mm -hmm. there forever. But but yeah. he will occupy Donetsk and Lugansk, maybe extend their borders a bit, but he will occupy. As long as he occupies that, he or Russia occupies it, not Putin. The point is the membership to NATO is closed mm -hmm. for uh, right. the uh, Ukrainians and for that matter, for the Georgians or the Belarusians. And that is what the buffer zone that Russia wanted to create is uh, created. The United States, on the other hand, has also, again, I'm being very cynical, has achieved what it wants. It has aligned all its uh, allies in a line. They're all uh, given an oath of fealty again, as it were. So you're and saying it's basically a win-win for both the United States and Russia, and they both achieved the this war. Eschew, all the verbiage yeah. and this thing. Yeah. Plus, yeah. the West comes out smelling of roses, uh, although it uh, did not... Uh, do well in the actual process yeah. because today Russia is this uh, bad guy that invaded and it is, let us yes. be very clear. Yes. So the perception war is a complete victory for the West. In fact, that perception war is going to create a perception war in India as to whether we should get off the fence or not to get off. We'll the come to what India should do, whether we should get no, off I'm the not, fence or I'm what should we do. That. <laughs> but Harsh, I wanted your take on how do you see this unfolding? Do you agree with what Nandan is saying? Uh, yes, I think by and large, see, uh, uh, as, as we were discussing, wars never end. So in some in some cases, uh, in, in some sense, uh, you know, the, the, the current status quo would continue. Uh, 
the the question is uh, the contours of that status quo might shift uh if if uh, georgia under some garb under some regime was more pro western the new regime might be more pro pro russian uh, you know but i think the fundamental sense in uh, you know but the fundamental question of uh, uh, of european security i think is is an important one and i'm not so sure how that gets resolved uh, even with a buffer zone even even if the even if there is a pro a pro russian government in in ukraine uh, because uh, you know that 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 so so that's that, that's something i think and the limits of diplomacy and the limits of warfare both are evident uh, in in this case and that both are not going to resolve those tensions and those tensions perhaps are the way in which europeans have lived for centuries they will again live for another century uh, now the question is uh, whether uh, you know uh, i think nandan has uh, you know touched upon that aspect of uh, uh you know this this interesting uh, duality uh, in in the responses that you find often also in india right it's 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 you know, see you can leave the matter um uh, aside uh, in one in one sense of what the government has to do or do what the government uh, should be doing uh, you know india's diplomatic preferences we all know are, are complicated you have positions on both sides both sides are important and 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 in in, a, in an interesting way uh, china's role becomes critical if you look at how much commentary china has generated in a crisis where china is not present uh, it's it's quite quite interesting uh, now but but what is what is fascinating to me as an observer here in india is that look if this were america invading any other country you would have left and right in india protesting out on the streets i mean it's 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 you know it's, yeah. it's 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 a spectacle that you would see even a small thing that america does you would have burning of american flags you would have people out on streets protesting down with america and then how american imperialism and here russia is doing something which is quite extraordinary by by contemporary standards and we are not i mean it's 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 very interesting the way um, the, the way we are trying to understand russia and which is i think an important russia is an important Uh, partner but that you don't see in the public imagination when it comes to america when it so so i just wanted to bring it on the table because that also tells you a story about uh, india russia relations uh, and and the public perception of how um, uh, you know america often is uh, is is portrayed uh, it's 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 very rare to see this happen uh, and uh, you know that you have a situation of this magnitude and not impacting um you know in, in india but that is what uh, that is what is uh, quite intriguing and ob- as, as an observer uh, you know this, yes. is, this is not about the policy but this is just about the uh, about society. the people or the society the you know the, I mean, of course it's very interesting word. yes you know i agree Th- this is a very interesting aspect of uh, the indian polity and just to add to what harsh said actually what has happened in indian polity is and i find this amazing uh, i was talking to a friend of mine the other day and he uh, was telling me that you know in the past for example in 1956 in 1968 the communist party of india marxist criticized uh the soviet union they came out publicly critical of the soviet union not only that you had national leaders like uh, jb kriplani and jayprakash narayan who spoke outright about this but today you don't have a single opposition politician voicing an opinion on the subject i mean it speaks volumes for the kind of polity we have today it's amazing i mean i find this absolutely amazing that all political parties who are out there at each other's throats let's say in up but on this nobody seems to have an opinion differing from the government uh, astounding absolutely but from you uh, nandan if you would like to comment upon you know india has of course maintained its neutrality and india has reiterated that it wants peace international peace uh, uh, but uh, you know there's again a division on that what should india do? should india be more proactive i mean there's expectation ukraine is looking up to india to of course there has been a, a talk between prime minister and president putin prime minister modi and president putin but uh, you know can india have a more a clear approach on this i think the conversation that took place between uh, modi at least the readout that uh, one has seen of the conversation that took place uh, between modi and uh, putin is significant in the sense that there are three levels there there are three different issues actually that have been touched upon one is the invasion itself and uh, modi in no uncertain terms seems to have told putin that it should cease and that uh, a diplomatic route should be found 
to resolve whatever grievances uh, uh, Russia has, uh, that we have made this public, is uh, quite remarkable. I think in that sense, you've uh, got off the fence. But you cannot afford to, uh, given where you are at this point of time, you don't want to offend uh, the Russians uh, or, for that matter, the United States. So you've found a via media uh, which is somewhere in between. The second level is you spoke about the uh, Indian students in Ukraine, about their safety. You brought it to the notice of the invader, as it were, and that this is a matter of concern for you. Uh, and uh, I think they have an, understood uh, the importance and would probably take steps. Right now, what has to be also kept in mind is you really don't have Russian troops all over uh, Ukraine. It's more uh, restricted to the kind of warfare that Russians are conducting in Syria, which is airstrikes, missile strikes, and uh, sort of suppression of military infrastructure of the opposition. And the third point, yeah. which of course we will all lose in this uh, uh, noise around Ukraine, which is a very interesting point in my opinion, is the fact that this is also a signal to both China and Pakistan. Mr. Imran Khan was there. Yes. At the point when this conversation took place. And here you have a peculiar situation that uh, the Indian Prime Minister has a serious conversation with Mr. Putin on matters of importance today to the world. And Mr. Imran Khan's readout of his conversation with Putin mentions nothing except a couple of bilateral issues. Yes, of course. There were, uh, it was a very ill-timed visit, according to a lot of uh, experts, that he should have probably avoided that. Uh, if he goes there and does not really make a statement or does not really take a position, it the, the visit was very ill-timed. Uh, Hush, uh, any, uh, any final comment that you would like to make on that? Uh, there will be sanctions. Of course, there are sanctions. The, the sanctions have not worked earlier, too, we've seen. But in this situation, the UK, uh, the US, uh, new sanctions would be probably imposed upon uh, Russia and the areas around. So, uh, you know, would that, but Mr. Putin seems to be totally undeterred by that and going forward with his plans. Yeah, no, I don't think sanctions would have any impact. Uh, I mean, we, we have seen that sanctions here. He, I mean, uh, he, uh, Russia had been under sanctions now since 2014. So uh, it's, uh, of course, they, they'll be ratcheted up, uh, but uh, it's not as if sanctions are going to determine uh, the larger uh, reality that uh, uh, that we face with Ukraine. Uh, but I think uh, by and large, uh, India's, uh, I mean, uh, the the reality for India is that this, this uh, you know, it, it cannot uh, afford to uh, lose either side. It is ironical yeah. in the case of India because, you know, see, India needs both Russia and the West together to fight uh, its strategic challenge, China. You really cannot afford to antagonize either. And I think that's something that uh, that many in the West perhaps don't understand. That it is not it is not the question of you know one can choose of course but even uh, even when you choose uh, the, the idea that you will be able to defend your critical interests especially vis-a-vis -vis China at this particular juncture uh, uh, without uh, you know uh, without consequences is is, is something that uh, we have to consider uh, and uh, and of course uh, you know the China factor is looming so large uh, but I think the larger long-term trajectory of whatever happens uh, and 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 I think Nandan has laid out uh, very very uh, clearly uh, in in the sense the conversation that India is having or India has begun to have with with the Russians on this question we also know that the, the, that uh, Indian Foreign Minister has had conversations with uh, with the U.S. with his U.S. counterpart so I think uh, you know that has also happened but I think what is what is interesting is that. Uh, in some ways, uh, uh, you know, India is still, uh, you know, it, it's still in a position to navigate this better than most states. And I think that's, uh, you know, as Nandan said, you know, whether you look at Imran Khan's visit, whether you look at the China question, whether you look at the fact that India is perhaps uh, would be one of the few countries that could tell Mr. Putin to cease invasion. Uh, and uh, and also talk about its own inter priorities. I mean, th that's something which I think India should in India can perhaps carry forward. 
but the consequences the costs may increase uh, with if, if this continues if the if this drags on and if the public opinion and in particular political opinion in the west turns uh, hard, you know is strongly against russia which it is becoming to and the consequences for issues like you know kadza uh, s400 all those issues become uh, they, they become part of the play so how the us congress is going to react to some of these developments i think those questions will be very important for india to consider as it moves forward and and i think india would be hoping that it is it, that the crisis resolves itself, itself quickly uh, so that at least some of those issues can be navigated deftly but but that is absolutely. not in, in india's hands absolutely well, india is trying its best and navigating this situation yeah. I yes like yes to add one final point i i am yeah. total agreement with what harsh said mm -hmm. and just a point again a small nuance that there are some divisions still in the west as to how to deal with russia and president biden brings it out very clearly when he announces the sanctions when he's asked the question by the wall street journal uh, correspondent about why was swift not done was it because some allies why did, why was russia not cut off from swift were there some allies who did not support it and he clearly says yes that there were allies who did not support this measure and therefore it is not implemented so clearly there are countries that uh, do not want to uh, uh, you know completely cut off uh, russia from the whatever interactions limited interactions russia has the second little bit of a nuance the united states itself in the last 24 hours bought increased its purchases of russian oil by 370 million so <laughs> You know, that's we, an interesting point to end this conversation. Uh, you know, we we yeah. it's very clear that everyone is a little has got multiple fingers in multiple pies, and, yeah. which is what makes it uh, uh, sort of hopeful. Which is why I'm hopeful that there will still be a window of opportunity for diplomacy. So let's hope there is an opportunity for the. Uh, for the window of diplomacy and things are settled soon. Thank you so much, both of you, for this conversation. We will keep tracking the situation in Russia, Ukraine, and the areas around uh, at ORF. Thank you for joining.